Greetings and salutations friends and welcome back to some more Warhammer 40k lore. Today we are looking at the Adeptus Astartes drop pod. One of those iconic things you keep seeing in 40k artwork and hearing about in the novels. And there is a reason for that. The reason is of course that it carries space marines inside of it and frankly anything that has space marines in it has to be an amazing thing. Except for that. God, Emperor, fuck that. <clears throat> okay, never mind that. Except for that, anything that has space moons in it has to be awesome. So, back to the point. The Adeptus Astartes drop pod is essentially a orbit-to-ground ballistic missile that can contain a few different loadouts for several different specific tactical and strategic roles. At least as long as that role includes hammering directly down into enemy formations at massive speeds. At first glance, this particular tactic might appear to be vaguely suicidal, and if it was used by anyone but the Adeptus Astartes, it probably would be. Or actually, it certainly would be. If you put an unaugmented human into a drop pod and launched it, it is... Shall we say... Uh uncomfortable for the human inside. In fact, he would no longer be a human, he would be transformed into slightly chunky jelly upon arriving on the ground. Naturally, simply surviving the landing isn't enough to make a effective use of the drop pod, as its entire gimmick is slamming directly down into the enemy, and, you know, if the dudes inside the pods are groggier than a Scotsman after a long night out, they are unlikely to be very useful in engaging the enemy. Space Marines, however, are more than able to not only survive the drop, but also remain entirely combat effective. Though, the question still remains though, why use a drop pod instead of a Thunderhawk, or some other and probably less violent means of transportation? Well, first and foremost, Astartes' lives are quite valuable, and they are also remarkably angry creatures, and so delivering them safely into the warm, welcoming bosom of the enemy is of paramount importance. And in this noble endeavour, the drop pod is, odd as it may seem, one of the safest options to guarantee getting the Astartes down and into combat. In most cases, the biggest threat to troops deployed from orbit is enemy anti-air defences, and the drop pod counters this threat through various factors, which, first and foremost, is the sheer ungodly speed. The drop pod is launched at a somewhat disturbed velocity from spaceships and use massive rocket thrusters to further increase the speed as it descends. On its journey planar side, the pod will reach speeds up to 12,000 km per hour. And as you can probably imagine, hitting an object the size of a Fiat Punto travelling at that speed is quite the task. And additionally, the pod itself is armoured to resist simple flak detonations nearby. It's essentially going to take a virtually direct hit to destroy a drop pod, which in most cases means it's going to take some form of guided warhead, but the drop pod also has countermeasures against this, as during its descent it will shed some of its outer layers of armour that at this point will be glowing red hot from the heat of atmospheric entry thereby creating effective countermeasures as it will be virtually impossible to tell a drop pod from a piece of falling armour on a radar or heat or specs. On the other hand, the downsides of such transportation is that the pod has no means of manoeuvring in anything but, well, planetary terms really, and cannot conduct any kind of evasive manoeuvres, and then of course there's the simple fact that plummeting towards a planet from high orbit at 12,000 kilometers in a steel box does come with a few health risks. But it is the landing that is the biggest advantage of such a drop pod, and it really makes up for the uh, inkling problems. The drop pod fires its braking thrusters at the last seconds. The first thing the enemy is therefore likely to know about the assault is a massive crash followed by a series of explosions as the mounted weapons on the armoured uh, casings of the drop pods 
start blasting them apart, and the side doors are blown away from the pod by exploding bolts, followed quite rapidly by space marines. Now, at this point, with the drop pods already amongst you, with heavy weapons mounted on the drop pods, spraying explosive ammunition everywhere, and space marines running rampant through your lines, it's usually too late to do anything about it. And as I explained in my Why Is There Melee videos, a space marine is a lethal opponent at virtually any range, but they truly shine in close combat with their massive strength, thick armor, and devastating weapons can be brought into full effect while also using the enemy's numbers against them. Not to mention that a space marine is a horrifying enough opponent in most situations, but again, if you're right up to him, He's going to outmatch you in strength, in speed, in reaction time, pretty much everything, so it's not just his armors and weapons that you have to worry about. And, naturally, this does have a rather dramatic effect. In fact, entire battles have been decisively won by drop pods hammering directly down into enemy formations or on top of command centers and releasing their rather lethal cargo of 12 tactical space marines directly into optimal killing range. This has even been used to devastating effect against orc hordes, which you might think that the orcs would be pretty damn good in melee combat, and they most definitively are. But they're not space marines. Additionally, even orcs do tend to get a wee bit surprised when a massive piece of steel hammers into their mids and releases angry killers in power armor. Now, in fact, some chapters actually specialize in this kind of massed drop pod assault against virtually any enemy, where essentially the entire chapter is dropped straight on top of the largest formations of enemies they can find. In some cases, these are carried out in smaller maneuvers where individual companies are dropped on the top of the enemy, but generally speaking, a full-on drop pod assault directly into the enemy's formations requires fairly high numbers, as you have to make maximum use out of the surprise, which means killing the maximum amount of enemies in the minimum amount of time, and even a space marine can only kill so many. However, 100 space marines, or 200 space marines, etc., and the numbers increase rather exponentially. So, this tactic has its own risks, of course, certainly, but the potential payoff is war-ending, as the enemy's primary force, along with much of their command and control infrastructure, is violently ripped apart in mere hours. Now, of course, the primary weapons of a drop pod are the starters inside, but they also come with a machine spirit operated storm bolter or fragmentation missile launcher to provide support to the disembarking Astartes when they are their most vulnerable when exiting the drop pod. Also, it is worth mentioning that if a drop pod does not come down at a correct angle, it occasionally lands in a uncomfortable position, blocking some of the doors and hindering them from being blown off correctly, which can trap Astartes inside the drop pod. Now, in most cases, uh, Astartes will simply be able to make their own way out using train swords, power fists, or even just their own inhuman strength, but it is going to take a few minutes for them to get out, which, again, means that the uh, mounted weapons can be quite useful in Indeed. After all, these weapons are pre primarily here to suppress the enemy. They are not here to kill the enemy, although that is certainly a bonus. The real damage, of course, comes in the form of the Astartes inside it. Lastly, let's take a look at some of the different types of drop pods, starting with one of the oldest, most powerful versions, the Great Crusade era Charybdis Drop Pod. The Charybdis was considerably larger than the standard drop pod used both now and then. It is capable of delivering twice as many legionaries to its target, 24 that is, and carried considerably heavier spot weapons, that's, you know, point defense weapons like the missile launchers, etc. Although in this case it was off the high powered melter cutters designed to cut through the hull of starships. 
it was primarily used as a ship-to-ship -ship weapon before the Horus Heresy, and generally speaking, 24 Crusade area legionaries would be considered gross overkill against all but the largest of enemy capital ships. Many of the older chapters still maintain some of these venerable drop pods, though it is unclear if they are still in active production, though it seems unlikely that even if they are in production, they're probably not being produced in any real numbers. We're talking maybe a few hundred a year, which, considering the size of the Imperium, is, well, fuck all, to put it simply. Next, we have a bit of an oddity. The Deathstorm drop pod. This one is unusual as it was invented during the Horus Heresy by the Raven Guards Legion to provide specifically heavy fire support to rapid insertion operations. You see, the Raven Guards are hit and run tacticians, they are guerrilla fighters. They can stand and fight with the best of them, being space marines naturally, but they do prefer to do it a slightly more subtle way. And they found that they were no longer fighting mere Xeno scum during the Horus Heresy, but brother legionaries. And Legion Astartes were um, considerably more competent than this pre-mentioned Xeno scum. This meant that their preferred rapid hit and run tactics could leave them at a severe disadvantage, as it was by no means guaranteed that they could destroy their targets quickly, or even that they could disengage if they failed in their opening assault. The Raven Guard solution was simple but effective. A standard drop pod with all of the crash harnesses and life supports replaced by heavy weapons and their guidance systems. Some were even equipped with rapid-firing assault cannons, and others with fragmentation and anti-tank missile pods. These weapons were launched ahead of a drop pod strike so that they would hit the ground and immediately blitz anything nearby with torrents of firepower, expending all of the onboard munitions in seconds. And only moments after this torrent of fire has finished, the rest of the drop pods would strike down and unleash their equally lethal cargo of legionaries. The pods could also be used as means of delaying an enemy. If the Raven Guards had to disengage from a battle, they would drop these Deathstorm drop pods directly in the path of the enemy, which would of course unleash an absolute ludicrous amount of firepower, enough to make even a legionary duck down and take cover for a few crucial moments, allowing the Raven Guard to slip away. This has later become standard operating procedure for most Space Marine chapters. Lastly, we have some variations. Some drop pods have been especially designed to bring down crew-served heavy weapons like rapiers or thunderfire cannons, and then we have a squad drop pod carrying 10 marines, a combat squad pod carrying 5, and even single-man drop pods used to deliver important Astartes personnel like officers or chaplains. These are then usually equipped with extra defensive systems like flak, extra armor, extra shielding, and a measure of maneuverability, although still not a whole lot, but any bit will help. And then we have the slightly larger Dreadnought drop pod capable of delivering one walking tank piloted by a supremely cranky space marine right down upon the heads most in need of bonking. There are a few other variations and some drop pod-like vehicles used by other races in 40k, but that will have to be material for another video. Until then, I have been Arch, thank you very much for watching, and I do hope to see you again soon. Have a good day.